Hey guys, um, quick recording, try to make this under at least an hour, probably hopefully under. Um, I was hoping that this stuff would be on the next quiz, but it's not on this quiz. So we're gonna do our best to learn the material. It's okay, it's just emails and analytes. So we'll focus again, mainly on problem solving, um, quick tricks and tips. Uh, again, try to make this under an hour. Um, also, if the audio is a little weird, it's because my headset broke today, um, RIP headset. I think I threw it on the wall too many times from losing too many video games. Um, anyways, um, so if it's if the audio sounds weird, I apologize. Hopefully it doesn't, but that's why. Um, but yeah, let's um, get right into it with the enols and enolates. Um, so back in the last video, we talked quite a bit about the additions of nucleophiles to carbonyls. This is the main topic of that video. Um, but one kind of core idea, right, um, that I was hoping you guys would get from it, and if you didn't, it's okay, because I'll say, say it right now. If I want to make these structures here, so the acetal, the imine, and then the here, the enamine, right, which just looks like this. So if I add a secondary amine, if I add a primary amine, if I add alcohols, right, really to do these additions, what we're doing is we're throwing them in acid. So carbonyls in acid with some nucleophile, whether it's nitrogen or oxygen based, right, um, they will add that nucleophile in to make these structures, right? So the acetal, the imine, and the enamine. So doing these nucleophilic additions, right, very consistently, um, usually just required some kind of acid catalysis. We really don't see base, right? If I wanted to do a very, you know, bad reaction, what I would do is, for example, take RO minus, put in ROH and make the hemiacetal, right? Remember, hemiacetals and, and really the hemiaminals as well, those guys are not very stable, right? Um, usually what will happen is the hemiacetal will just decompose right back into the carbonyl, unless you're an acid, because then you can push towards the acetal, but we're not, you know, we're not an acid, we're in base. So usually these guys just fall apart, um, don't really form anything. And unless they're cyclic, right? So uh, for example, if I have this here, unless I'm making a cyclic acetal, sorry, cyclic hemiacetal, like glucose, for example, I'm not really expecting a reaction answer to be a hemiacetal, right? So base catalysis was just not very good for these addition type reactions. And that's why we never really see it, right? We normally just see acid. Um, is usually what we see. Or we see some kind of like super strong reduction reaction. So that was the other reaction, but we don't need to worry about those for now. That's uh, we can ignore those for the time being. Yeah. But I also hinted at the fact that, you know, even though that's the case, right, that these base catal, you know, these base type reactions are not very good, right? Kind of bad. They're in the bad cage. Um, they do have a different purpose, right? And to understand that purpose, what is the other thing they usually want to do with them? Um, it helps to remember that we're talking about bases right? Bases that like protons. So if I have a base, it doesn't matter what the identity of the base is currently, but if I have some base um, and I introduce it to this, to this carbonyl compound, you might imagine that it wants to take a proton, right? Because these guys love protons. Proton love. Or we'll put proton with a heart. Oops, that's a really ugly heart. Right? Proton with a heart. They love protons, right? So happy to see them whenever, whenever they're around. So if I look at this carbonyl compound, I try to look for a proton, Really the only proton is the one that's right here on the carbon next to this carbonyl. Okay. The carbon that we call next to the carbonyl, we call this the alpha carbon. So the hydrogen by association then is the alpha hydrogen. So bases can take this proton here. I mean, at the moment it's the only one, so we're kind of forced to do that. Okay. So we can put electrons on that carbon there. So we get this C minus here. Okay. Now I know we really haven't talked about PKA very much or we haven't really talked about acidity since 8A. Um, but it might help to remember a couple of things about acidity when it comes to pulling out protons. One of the main things being that when we think of acidity from the periodic table perspective, um, I'm mainly looking at the top right corner and I'm thinking that things that are acidic usually are to the right and they're down. So this is where acidic is, right? If something is basic, it's going to be up and to the left, right? So here. So when I see that I'm deprotoning this carbon here, it feels a little weird, doesn't it? Because carbon's in the basicity corner. So you would think that, wait a minute, if we're talking about acidity and pulling out protons, and carbon should be the worst at that. I mean, we have a couple of values to kind of, um, you know, to kind of reinforce that too. Let's say that I had a propane here, and I wanted to pull off of hydrogen off of propane. Um, that hydrogen there clocks in about 50 in pKa. 
just a reminder that pKa is an inverse scale. The higher or the lower it is, the more acidic something is. Okay. The more acidic something is. Um, so in the case of propane, um, having that hydrogen um, on that carbon, not too great, right? And that's not really easy to pull off. But, you know, I could do a little trick here. I could hybridize less. I could turn it from SP3 to SP2. And usually this will drop it down a little bit to about 45. I guess it's not too crazy, but it's a little bit better. So propane's a little bit better. So you might remember those orbital effects from 8A, right? Um, eventually, get to the alkyne, right? This is 25. So alkynes are a bit better, right? Dropping that hybridization a little bit does drop it a bit, but CO is still a pretty strong basis. So you might think, okay, well, I guess bases aren't really going to do this job very often of pulling off this proton if the numbers that we have to play with are 50 to 25, right? And actually, if you kind of think about it, really, the resemblance in the molecule, right? This doesn't look like an alkyne carbon, does it? Um, it looks more like the propane carbon. So you might think, oh, that's probably going to be close to 50. It doesn't really matter. But the thing to keep in mind here is that this lone pair, it's next to a carbonyl, right? It's next to a pi bond. And lone pairs next to pi bonds like to resonate. So what we'll get is a movement of electrons from the C minus into the O minus. And this is, oh, okay. O minus is a different story when it comes to acidity, right? If I just think of the canonical O minus base like a thoxide, so the, you know, or even just OH minus, I mean, these guys clock in around 16 to like 18, okay? Um, OH minus closer to 16, um, should really be like 14, but whatever. Um, o minus, you know, R thoxide more closer to 18, right? Um, point being is that these guys are a lot more acidic. So this alpha hydrogen, you know, lone pair, um, or this alpha hydrogen deprotonation actually can lead to O minus character. And really, when we think about this deprotonation, what we're thinking about is this guy here, okay? So we have a name for this guy, we call it the enolate, right? But the enolate really, when we think about it, is an O minus with this CC pi bond, okay? So where do we put this, right? In terms of a pKa value, where does this go? Does it go closer to the O minus value or does it go closer to the C minus value? Well, it is, again, when we think about this more likely or more in the case of an O minus, it's a, it's a lot more stable in that case. Um, so it's definitely not up there at 50. Um, and usually what we tend to see is that this guy is very close to the alkoxide, actually. Um, interestingly enough, it's around 16 to 22, depending on the type of carbonyl that you have. Okay? So incredibly more acidic than all the carbon-based acids, and about the same depending on the type. Uh, you know, when it comes to alcohols, is about the, or you know, compared to alcohols, is about the same. Okay, I think uh, you know. I remember seeing you know any pK value you see in this class, you need to write it down in a note card. It's just fair game um, for a question where you have to assign pKa's or know them. I think I remember seeing there was two other types. Um, there was the uh, nitrogen base, so NH two. This is usually around thirty-five to forty. Um, that's usually where it clocks in around. So just write that down. Um, that's just to you know reinforce the idea that carbon sucks, nitrogen sucks, oxygen's better, right? Um, kind of idea. Um, this analyte idea, you know, you can also just apply it to any kind of system, right? Um, you could also even just remove this carbon here and make it like an oxygen. So we've actually seen this before, right? Um, this allylic or this analyte type system where we deprotonate on that alpha position. Um, we just seen it in the carboxylic acid. We just didn't realize it. Okay. Um, you can do that too. And so this, I mean, you replace oxygen for carbon, you have just insanely stabilized the system. This carboxylic acid usually clocks in around three to five. Okay. So resonating electrons, very, very good effect. Okay. In fact, um, in this class, you can kind of almost even think if, you, if a lone pair can resonate, Right. If a lone pair can resonate, if you give it the ability to resonate, it's going to be significantly more um, stable than it would be if you didn't allow it to resonate. I want you guys to remember that. We'll come back to that idea in a second. Okay, cool. So just know these values and how they kind of align to each other. Again, analytes is the main topic of discussion here, so we'll kind of focus on that. Um, but in that, right, we can talk about aldehydes and ketones, right? Those are, again, our main um, study for this, uh, for this section of the course. Um, and talk about their different acidities. Because remember, ketones and aldehydes, they're not the same reactivity. Aldehydes are more reactive than ketones in terms of towards nucleophilic acyl addition. So how do they, you know, how do they stand when it comes to deprotonation? So if I wanted to take off this hydrogen here. Well, an easy way to think about this is that both of these have the same 
left side. They both have this side here. So obviously that's not what's changing. What's gonna change? It's gonna be this here, okay? So whether we have an H or we have a uh, methyl here. Now, if I think about this conceptually, in order to stabilize or make more acidic my anion, again, both of these share basically this whole part here. So we can't make any comment that they are different because of that part there, right? The alpha carbon and the carbonyl. So we have to think about what contribution does the H have or this CH3, right? Or this alkyl chain have that can result in stabilization or destabilization of this, um, of this base here or of this you know, anion here. You know, one conceptual way to think about it is if I wanted to stabilize this minus, right, what kind of charge would I want to put on this side here? Or, you know, what would I want on there um, that makes it more stable? At the very least, I'd want some kind of positive charge, wouldn't I? If I have something positive, then this is going to pull, right, on that, uh, the positive is going to pull on the electrons. It's going to stabilize those electrons, pull them closer to the nuclei. So groups that are on the carbonyl that are either neutral or positive are going to be better than any groups that are partial negative or groups that will donate electrons towards that minus, right? We want some kind of positive charge here so that there's like a pull, a mutual agreement that, hey, we like each other, so we want to be closer. Um, if there were some kind of partial positive, or sorry, partial negative, or if there were some kind of, um, you know, donating effect, um, we wouldn't be really happy, right? We want to have a positive effect. Um, right, and I guess another way to think about it is if this is positive, right, the dipolar effect, right, will, will, will pull on these electrons and make them more stable. This is very, very good. So when I look at a, a hydrogen, I know I've been doing all this on a hydrogen. Hydrogen is kind of like a neutral effect, right? Um, there's not really much going on there. Um, you know, this is kind of like a zero, so there is nothing going on there. But let's say that I had, for example, like a CF3. Okay, so I had a C trifolar methyl formate or form formaldehyde. Um, well, this is a withdrawing group, so it's going to pull, oops, not that. It's not what I wanted, actually. I wanted this, sorry. Um, it's going to pull on the electrons. And again, pulling on those electrons, we're having this positive carbon here, it's going to stabilize it. So having these what we call EWGs, um, kind of back in the benzene groups, right? These groups that like to pull electrons or withdraw electrons, it's going to increase the acidity of that position. Right, so a way to think about it. On the other hand, right, if I have like a ketone, right, that has a CH3. Remember, CH3 is back in uh, benzene and benzene groups. Those are electron donating groups, right? That's going to inductively donate in electrons. And again, if I have electrons going into that carbonyl, uh oh, this minus charge is now very, very mad that we did that. Like, oh, I wanted a positive there. I want more minuses here, right? Um, there's too much, too much uh, minus activity going on, right? I want more positivity. Okay. So groups that donate into the carbonyl right, interfere with the minus charge, causes them a headache, right, makes them go, ah, I don't want that. On the other hand, having a positive charge, very, very good, very, very ideal, makes things very happy. Aldehyde's kind of like in the middle there, right, it has a zero, so it's kind of like the standard. Um, it's not donating or withdrawing, so it, it's better than a ketone, but not as good as having like, say, a CF3 bound to that carbonyl. Okay. So generally speaking, aldehydes will be more acidic than ketones, usually clocking in around 16, 18, just like those um, alkoxides. Um, ketones, a little bit, little bit higher, well, like 20 to 22. Um, that's usually where we clock those in. Now, we can even talk about another carbonyl type of group, which we call the ester, because I remember seeing this. Um, esters are also capable of making enolates, and we will talk about their enolates and what they do later on in the course. Um, probably after this quiz, we'll talk about them, um, or the quiz after. But enolates, for these guys, again, forming here, again, if we think about what oxygen is doing, it kind of has two effects here, right? One is that it can inductively pull on the carbonyl. It's electronegative. So in one case, it has the withdrawing effect that we need, right, to have higher acidity, right? On the other hand, we also have a lone pair that's a resonance donator. So we have an inductive pulling, an inductive withdrawal, which increases acidity, and a lone, pain, a, a lone pair donor, right? So we're physically moving electrons into that system, right, causing electrons to go a little bit awry with each other, like, ah, there's too many electrons in the system. So it's also having a lower acidity effect. So esters are kind of like a little bit of a conundrum, right? Which one is it? Is it going to be more withdrawn, or is it going to be more donated? Um, is it going to be higher in acidity or lower in acidity? Turns out, that when it comes to groups like oxygen and nitrogen, who have very good pi overlap, 
Um, if those words make no sense, that's totally okay because I'll explain what they mean. Um, for groups that can resonate really well that are in the same row as carbon, so nitrogen and oxygen, um, the donating effect is actually a lot stronger than the withdrawal effect. So esters, despite having that slight, you know, despite having a withdrawal effect, we'll say it's very slight, really the highest effect they have is the electron donating. Okay? And that's because they're electron donating by resonance. That's a very strong effect. So acidity really, really, really tanks here. Usually a good value for you guys is around 25. So a lot less acidic. So it's the fact that their group is donating so much, it's so negative, right, that it's clashing with the electrons that we formed on that alpha position. Okay, cool. This here is what we would call like an inductive donator, if you wanted to term for that, inductive donator, right? This here would be inductive withdrawer. So increases acidity, okay? So generally, again, don't just memorize these trends, understand them, right? Understand what it is that's influencing the um, reactivity or influencing the uh, stability of these anions, right? It's a game of who is pulling and who is pushing, essentially, right? You have a bit, if you have pushing, electron pushing, right? Very, very not good thing. But if you have electron pulling, very, very good thing, okay? So generally speaking, if you want like a trend, Right, aldehydes are better than ketones, which are better than esters. And again, know these values, please know them. Please, please, please know them. And that was that common feature, right? Please know these values. Um, you will be tested on them. It's, just, it's a very easy question to ask, especially since you have a note card. She's expecting 500 students to show up on, on, Thursday, on Friday morning um, to have a note card packed with numbers. So please be one of those students, okay? Cool. Now, one last thing that can affect acidity is let's say that I have a ketone, for example, and on this alpha position, I add another ketone. So not only are we alpha to one carbonyl and we can resonate, but we're alpha to another carbonyl and we can resonate. You can imagine this will increase stability very, very much, okay? A lot, it'll increase stability by a lot, okay? Um, these carbonyls, we call dicarbonyl compounds or beta carbonyl compounds, very, very stable, very, very stable. Um, generally speaking, these guys clock in about half the, half the amount that you would for a normal enolate. So the diketone, if I wanted to give it a value, um, the diketone I'd give around, oof, I should know the number. I'm going to guess it's around like 10. Um, and then it, it changes depending on what's around it. So for example, let's say I took a diketone and I added um, an ester on the end there. You know, um, one, I mean, this has just become a game of matching, right? We know where the aldehyde is. We know where the, the ketone is. We know where the ester is in relation to each other, right? This is sort of how acidity works. So as we mix it, if we consider this our standard, as we mix and match, you can imagine where things will lie. For example, if I add an ester, right, that's, uh, that's you know, that's worse than a ketone. So I change this, es this ketone for an ester, you know, that's, that's lowering acidity. So this should be around like 13, right? That's a good value for that. Let's say that I go to a keto aldehyde, right? Hey, aldehydes are better than ketones. So that's going to be, right? This hydrogen or this anion here, in terms of acidity, that's gonna be a little bit lower. It's gonna be around nine, right? Let's say that I have a dialdehyde, that's gonna be around eight, right? Um, relatively where these are. So, I mean, the lecture, I know you guys covered them. I should have looked at what the numbers were that she gave you, but whatever they were, just write them down and understand that, you know, mixing and matching these beta dicarbonyls um, is going to result in, I mean, high acidity, but relatively speaking, depending on the type of group, you can see where things kind of lie, right? Um, depending on which ones you're mixing and matching. I guess a hard one to kind of put here is what if I had an aldehyde and an ester, right? Where would that kind of lie? I would say that it probably falls around 10, Right, you have a very good aldehyde, but a very bad ester. Um, so it kind of falls in between, you know, with that dicarbonyl, probably around 10 ish. Right. But again, whatever you saw in lecture, that's what you're going to get tested on. So please know that. Um, that is going to be, um, that's is, that is what's going to be tested on. Okay. Cool. Now, again, one last thing um, before I move on from this um, dicarbonyls, uh, it's important that they're beta. There is a possibility she might do this. Um, just to mess with you guys. Um, this is not a beta dicarbonyl. This is an alpha dicarbonyl. And this kind of structure here, right? There's only one alpha position, right? That one there. 
So this would be close to um, you know you know 19 or 20, right? This is more similar to 19 or 20. It, it's important that if you're going to make the argument that something is a beta dicarbonyl, that it is able to resonate into both carbonyls. If I draw the anion here, um, hopefully you'll see that there is absolutely no way that I can resonate into both carbonyls. I can only resonate to one. There's no way to access this guy here. I know it looks like there is, but there, there isn't, trust me. Okay, so just be careful on that. Okay, cool. All right, so that's on the acidity side of these carbonyl compounds. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about these enolates, right? Like what, what, makes, them so, what makes them so important? Um, why, why, do we, why do we even care about them? Okay, um, like I mentioned, the idea is, is that we're deprotonating at the alpha position. So this here, so I could even have a ketone that looks like this, right? Um, like a symmetric ketone like this. Um, and it's still this position here next to the carbonyl that matters, right? Um, that's the position that I'm deprotonating at. And what we get out is this um, resonating system, okay? So a great question then could be, you know, who is gonna deprotonate these guys, right? Who are acceptable, acceptable bases um, that we can use if we want to get a deprotonation on a ketone or an aldehyde. Well, again, since the range is around 16 to 20, so around 16 to 20, right? Some good bases to use are alkoxide bases because alkoxide bases clock in around 16 to 18. So if I have like, for example, that RO minus, RO minus is not terrible bad um, base to, to do this deprotonation. So for example, ethoxide, that's like a base you can think of, right? We'll form an equilibrium here, okay? Now, one thing to understand is that, you know, especially because uh, these are very close values, this is a very equilibrating uh, mixture, right? Again, this is around like 16 to 18. This is around 16 to 20, right? Especially if I made this the aldehyde version. So if I went ahead and made this like an aldehyde, like this is even so much more the case that this is going to be um, an equilibrating solution of enolate. Um, you're not going to have a 100% enolate. So you'll have, you know, majority deprotonated, but not all of it deprotonated. Um, this is just because of the fact that the PKAs are so similar. So there's more of an equilibrium uh, between the two. That can, that can be an advantageous thing, if you'd like, um, if you'd want to do that. If you wanted, for whatever reason, to do a full deprotonation, and we can go over a good reason why you might want a full deprotonation, um, you can use stronger bases. So let's say, I let's say I take the same aldehyde and I introduce um, a stronger base like LDA. LDA looks like this. It kind of looks like that thing in Star Wars. Um, I forgot what they're called. It's like the thing that looks like this. That's, that's what it always reminds me of. Um, I don't know. Anyways, um, LDA, super strong base, PKA around 35. Okay. So if this hydrogen here is around 16 and we use a base that's like 20 units higher, what we get is a kinetic irreversible deprotonation. So back here where we had more of an equilibrium because the PKs were similar, here the PKs are not similar at all, right? We have a huge 20 PK dif unit difference. So when we introduce LDA to this compound, virtually all of the aldehyde is going to convert. Virtually all of it, almost instantly, it's going to convert over. Okay? So we'll get like a 100% conversion. Um, here we'll get usually like a 70-ish percent conversion. Um, or you know whatever the depends on the on the aldehyde honestly, but seventy percent just to kind of give you a number that's not one hundred percent, but it's still pretty high. Um, that's the kind of conversion that we'll see. But again, we can control for how much of this stuff that we want. Now, why might this be advantageous? Well, for some reactions where we want to you know use the enolate as the nucleophile, right? We might want to fully convert over to the enolate form and then introduce the electrophile to this enolate. Right? So maybe for some reaction, I want this aldehyde, and then I want to do like an SN2, which we'll talk about on the next page. Right? Um, very, very popular to do an LDA or some kind of full deprotonation. You can also do this with NAH, also around like 32-ish, um, this, this base here. Um, go ahead and do this. We'll get the alkylation um, on the aldehydes, and we have no nothing really to worry about right? because we did the full deprotonation, and now we'll get all the aldehydes to react with that alkyl halide. On the other hand, these equilibrating solutions are really, really good for the aldol reaction, okay, where we condense two carbonyls together. So maybe actually the electrophile that I want to use is the carbonyl itself. And, you know, in order to do that, I need to have some leftover carbonyl, right? If the point is, is I want to use this to attack itself, you know, the carbonyl version, do the aldol condensation, I need to have some, um, you know, aldehyde left over. I can't just 
wholly convert it into the uh, into into the NLA form. So that's where we can have a little bit of you know why we want to use one over the other or why you might see one over the other, um, and also tells you that we have now a good cue for what kind of reactions we want to do. Right? If you see a carbonyl with a alkoxide base like ethoxide or even terputoxide, any O minus type base. So if we want to make this super generic, we can even go down to um, R O minus. Right, something like that. Um, that is a very good cue that what you want to draw or what you want to think about is the aldol condensation. If you see like an LDA step, um, usually you'll see a second step with some kind of electrophile. And usually that's the reaction that we want to do is with that electrophile. Okay, cool. Now, one last thing before we get into the first reaction, which is the alkylation reaction I described. Um, one kind of important thing to understand about these NLA reactions is that um, we are heavily simplifying the stuff. So there are going to be some things that just don't make sense right now, or will probably never make sense, but it's okay. As long as you just accept what I'm saying and you accept the rules, you'll be fine in this class. Um, one of those things is that despite the fact that this is the more stable version of the enolate, and so you would imagine that this has the highest character in solution right, of the, um, of the resins forms, it turns out that the alpha carbon enolate is where we do a majority of the reactions. Okay. Now that might be a little weird, but the kind of the, the idea that I've kind of you know came up with to kind of reconcile this, make it a bit easier to swallow, is to think that if the O minus is stable, then the C minus must be unstable. And so when we're at the C minus is when we see a majority of reactions. Now, is it quite that you know simple and clear cut um, you know, real life? Not really, but on paper it works great and is what we're going to use. So when we do our reactions, you're welcome to use either form. Um, but it might just be helpful to use the C minus so you can see where things are going. Okay, um, you won't have to really worry about, you know, um, where things are going to react. They're always going to react at carbon. So all these analyte reactions, they're just going to react at carbon. Now, one other, I guess actually, there's one other thing we could mention. I didn't really see this, so I'll go through this really quickly. And if you need to know it, you can look at it. If you don't need to, it's okay. Um, one other thing we can quickly talk about is ketones that are regioisomeric in terms of alpha position as, or their alpha position is different. Um, aldehydes are great. They only have one alpha position, right? So we don't have to worry about too much. Um, and symmetric ketones, again, don't have to worry too much. They're both the same. But whenever we have asymmetric differences, we can actually control for which enolate we get. Um, if I use a small base like NaH, um, you usually get the more sub enolate just like that. Um, we call this the thermodynamic enolate. Um, if I have a large base like LDA, usually what you get is the less sub. So this here, okay? Uh, we call this the kinetic base. You can also achieve this by using RO minuses. Any RO minus will also do thermodynamic, um, you know, deprotonate on the more sub. So in case you need to know that, in case you need to know how to distinguish between two positions, um, this is the way to do it. Okay, but I, I don't think I remember seeing that. Um, oh, shout out to the person who sent their notes, by the way. I forgot to say that. Um, but I don't think I remember seeing that when I looked at the notes real quick. But in case, just in case, um, that's one. That's something you can do. Okay, cool. So let's look at the first reaction. What can we do? Um, well, we can take a carbonyl, like an aldehyde. Um, I can expose it to LDA. So first step, we'll make it into the enolate, which again, means that there's a minus charge at that position there. And then I can just introduce some electrophile. Right. Usually what you'll see is primary alkyl halides. So primary alkyl halide. Um, and what that essentially is doing is it's adding whatever the R group is, is to that anion. So we can do an alpha transformation. So I can make the enolate as is and add on the R group just like that. Just right there, just like that. Okay. So um, usually very reliable reaction. Um, you can do it with ketones too. Let's do it with this one. Um, I'll use NaH this time just to expose you guys to different bases. But let's say that I had this um, and I did this reaction. Um, hey, this is a good one. Where is it going to go, right? Where is the enolate going to form? Remember, enolate requires an acid base. So there has to be a hydrogen on the alpha carbon. So if I look here versus here, there's alpha hydrogen here, but there isn't one on that left side. So I'll form that there. And then this is what's going to add the one, two, three, four carbon chain. So one, two, three, four, we're on that third carbon and we have a methyl. Just like that. Okay. Just like with the last unit, if there's ever do you form a chiral center, just assume we form both of them. The treat the, the cheat code is a plus minus. Um, that means that you're forming both the dash and the wedge. 
Um, but that's up to, I, I don't know how much of an emphasis that was made of um, when you guys were taught that. So I wouldn't really stress too much about it. Okay. Um, again, this reaction is usually limited to primaries or even or methyls. So the methyl example is if there was like CH3I and I would just be adding like a, a methyl. So if I added it to this top one, I would just be adding um, CH3 here. Right. Um, if you do it on a secondary or tertiary, again, you're going to, I mean, the pK of this is really high. Um, for those of you who might remember, strong bases like to do elimination. So those reactions are not really going to work very well if you do that. Um, so that kind of sucks, but it's okay. Um, actually, a bit of a cheat code is that you can use the, um, the dicarbonyl anion. So this is actually something that I proposed doing uh, when I was working here. Um, we were working on a ketone and I wanted to functionalize this position of the ketone. Um, add some groups on it. So you can imagine, um, let's go on the next page. So I work on this ketone, or I did work on this ketone. And what I wanted to do was use the enolate. So use like an NAH and then use, um, I'll just use this here, right? To kind of get this here. Um, oops, sorry, with R there. R was actually supposed to be an alkyne. That's what R is in my case like that. Um, that was something that I proposed that I wanted to, to try out and have fun with doing. Um, the, usually the, the question you'll get is, how do you know it'll work? And if it, like, if it doesn't, if it eliminates, what do you do? The answer is, is that you use the dicarbonyl version of this because the dicarbonyl version is less basic, um, a lot more attenuated, um, very much more willing to accept an electrophile um, in a, as a substitution. So, hey, look at that. We're doing gym chemistry. That must be fun, right? Or, I don't know, I was in a, I was in a draw. Um, or whatever. There we go. So yeah, we're doing gym chemistry. Isn't that fun? Yeah, cool. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so you can do alkylations. Very straightforward reaction. I think if you just do the practice, you'll be fine. Um, there isn't anything too crazy. The only crazy version of this, I guess you can make is like an intramolecular where she puts like a bromide down here. What, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this could be like the craziest version. NaH, right, that'll form an anion here and then I'll cyclize there. So one attacks two, three, four, five. So what we're essentially making is a five-membered ring here. Um, oh, let me, sorry, let me, um, let me do that. Um, one, two, three, four, and five, right? Where on one, there was that aldehyde. So that's like the craziest thing she could possibly do um, is it didn't trick like that, but yeah, alkylation is totally fine. Um, really, the important reaction here that you really want to know um, and have a and have an understanding of is the aldol condensation. Um, that is the most important reaction. So we'll spend the rest of the time on this. And again, um, I'll, I'll I'll do my best to you know stick to the tricks um, so that we can finish within about twenty minutes here. Um, aldol condensation. What is this reaction? So I mentioned that if you use LDA, you get a complete deprotonation, or NaH get a complete deprotonation because the pKs are so high relative to the ketone and the aldehyde. So you virtually all enolate, and that enolate can be captured by um, whatever carbonyl system you have, or sorry, whatever um, electrophile system you have in solution. But sometimes, uh, actually a lot of the times, what we want to do is take our carbonyl that we're turning to an enolate and actually just add it to itself. This is the aldehyde or the aldol condensation. So if I use, let's say, a equilibrating base, so like an R minus. Any RO minus will work here, by the way, whether it's true butoxide, um, whether it's ethoxide, anything will work as long as it's an RO minus. It's a, usually a very safe bet base there. But again, what we'll get is a deprotonation on this position here. And you can show the resonance form uh, on a quiz if you had to do a mechanism for this. Uh, you know, you definitely want to show the resonance form. Um, that's, you know, so I guess I'll do it. Um, but again, remember the, the, the anion that we're doing the attack with would be this one. You could do it with this one too, just to draw an extra arrow. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to attack another one of our cells, right? So if we started off as the acetaldehyde and we turn to the acetaldehyde enolate, we're going to attack another acetaldehyde enolate, right? Because again, carbonyls are great acceptor, acceptors of of um, sorry nucleophiles, and so this is a great nucleophile. We can go ahead and get this attack. Okay. So what we'll get out, um, you will always make this frame here, by the way. So in this attack, you'll always make this frame here. Um, it's just a matter of numbering, knowing where things go. So this would be one, this would be two. So 
alpha car or sorry, the analyte carbonyl is one, the alpha carbon is two, the one you attack is three. So this would be one, two, and three. You're always gonna make this here and then just put things where they have to go. So H goes on one, and then it looks like methyl goes on three. There's also an H on three as well, but we don't have to draw it in. Okay. And so what we can get is this addition here, right? This nucleophilic addition here. And something in solution, probably an ROH, we'll go ahead and donate a proton. And what we get out is the aldol product. Half aldehyde, half alcohol. That's where aldol comes from. So this here is the aldol addition product. Okay. And this is the result of adding in a little bit of base with your aldehyde um, and letting them sit there, right? Letting them attack each other. Again, this is the reason why we don't really expect, um, well, one, this is why we don't do reactions in base with enamines, because then you have enamine amine competition with the aldol. And it's also why hemiacetal reactions, um, well, I mean, we don't really see um, hemiacetals forming in base, right? Because this product here is what ends up dominating that deprotonation into the attack on itself. Okay, so we get the aldol addition. Again, usually what you'll do this is, you'll do this as a self-condensation, or that means is like, you'll do this with like a molecule that reacts with itself. So let's say I do it with this ketone here. Um, actually, let me do it with the acetone molecule. Actually, no, we'll do it with this one, okay? Again, base is gonna pull off this proton here. Minus, where this equilibrates like that. Okay. Um, and then just attack one of itself. So um, let's kind of draw it up here, but I'll do it for this one, right? The minus attacks there. Again, you're always going to form this here, this structure here. It's just a matter of numbering, right? NLA carbonyl is one, NLA alpha is two. And then the thing you attack is three, or the carbonyl attack is three, so one, two, and three. Okay, and then so what we get, so on three we have, looks like two of these ethyl groups coming out of it. On two, we have a methyl coming out. And then on one, we have an ethyl, okay? So there we go, so we get this. Again, something in solution will protonate the um, OH there, or the O minus, sorry. And what we get out is this here, the aldol product. So again, mostly self-condensations is what you see for these additions. Um, and it's just a matter of attacking yourself and, you know, keeping track of where things are going. I like, you know, I like this trick because when you initially do it, it kind of helps you keep track of things and you'll slowly start to see patterns as to how to do this. Um, hopefully, you know, again, it, it, you can use my trick if you like. It, it's just a good starting point um, for, for you. Okay, cool. Let's do one more um, bit of a complex one. Again, just point here is just to help you guys visualize the mechanism and, you know, just in case you need to do this mechanism on your quiz, right? Um, you know, you've done it enough times now to the point where it's like second nature. Okay, so we'll get this resonating form here. This attack another one of ourselves. Again, it doesn't matter which form you use as long as you use one, right? Um, and then what we'll end up with is the aldol product, which again, carbonyl, oh wait, O minus. If I label this again, one, two, and then three, where one is analyte carbonyl, two is alpha carbon analyte, uh, analyte's alpha carbon, and then three is the um, carbonyl we're attacking. So one, two, and three. Looks like on one, we have an H. On two, we have, looks like three carbon chain. And then on three, we have that, a four carbon chain. Oh, did I draw something wrong? One, two, three, four. Oh, okay, never mind. that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. And again, I won't show it, but something will protonate this in solution. Okay, and we get the addition product. Okay. Aldol additions are really, really good. Um, usually these proceed at even very low temperatures, like negative 78. Um, if you guys want to impress your TA, negative 78, that's the combination of acetone and dry ice. So whenever chemists, organic chemists need a very, very, very cold solution, um, what we do is we, uh, we have these like very specific um, we have these like very specific, I don't know what you would call them, like it's like jars, I don't know, or like these containers that have these like chips in them. They're meant to meant to make sure that the uh, glass doesn't like explode. Um, but you put in here acetone or and, and you slowly put in dry ice. You put in too much, it starts to pop a little too much, um, but that will give you a combination that is very, very cold. And that's how we run these really low reactions. 
Um, anyways, little little side thing there. Okay, cool. Anyways, um, so that is the Aldol edition. Again, this runs really usually really super low. Okay, um, but the one thing about the Aldol edition is that unless you're running it at negative seventy eight, it's not going to stop at the edition. Okay, so again, at this Aldol, right? We're only going to stop only stops at negative seventy eight. So something really, 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 really low. Okay. In reality, at room temperature and most other temperatures that you're going to talk about in class, this reaction is going to proceed um, to a different product. Okay. And so that is going to be this here. So we'll do it with this guy. So what's going to happen? All right. What ends up happening is that this hydrogen here that's between the carbonyl and the alcohol usually very acidic, right? It's between, it's, it's alpha to the um, carbonyl and it's next to an inductive alcohol. So a base will pull that proton off. We're gonna minus here. And then this minus will go ahead and kick off the OH in a sort of E1 style reaction. Okay. Actually, there's a name for this. It's not really an E1. We call this something else. We call this an E1CB. Okay, so another cool thing, if you want to impress your friends, um, you can you can tell them, you know, hey, the uh, aldol dehydration is the E1CB. Okay, um, cool. And what we get out is an enone. Whoa, that's the stuff that we were making earlier, right? So, you know, a great question that you can get on your quiz on Friday is, um, hey, let's, uh, let's take this guy and turn it into an enone. Whoa, how did you do that in two seconds? I'll show you the trick in a second. Um, and then do a conjugate type addition. So look at that. I would not be surprised if this is the one of the sequences on your quiz tomorrow, where those are the answers you want to put. Okay, where you're doing some kind of RO minus ROH, and then you're doing in this case NACN HCl, right? Where it adds beta um, to the system. Okay, so look at that. We're making those conjugated systems um, that we. Uh, that we were just learning how to react earlier um, yesterday. Okay, so how does this work, right? Why is it that we're kicking off OH minus? Because isn't that something that we talked about as a bad leaving group in 8A? Um, well, it turns out that because the N system is conjugated, right, this N system is conjugated, um, kicking off OH minus is actually not that bad of a deal. Um, it's totally fine. And in reality, we kind of lied to you guys. O minus is not that bad of a leaving group, especially if you're in basic solution where the surrounding pH, the surrounding pKa of things is around um, OH minus is pKa. Um, everything is about relatively simple or same in, in acidity. Um, so it's okay that OH minus is lost there. Okay. But a majority of times, what you're really going to do is push towards the enone product in these reactions. That's really what you want. Okay. So even back here for all of these guys, what's going to happen is we're going to dehydrate across this pi bond, which again is going to first deprotonation and then kick off. But what we're really going to get is this here. Okay. For this one down here, um, a little cramped, so I'll just kind of draw it on here. But really, we're going to get right, if I just draw the if I draw the OH here instead, right? We're going to pull off this hydrogen here. What we're really going to get is this here. Is that enone there? Okay. So dehydration into that enone. Okay. So what's a fast and easy way that I can predict this product so I don't have to spend twenty years? Um, drying out the mechanism and you know wasting all my time on the quiz. Super, 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 super easy, simple trick. Okay. If I'm doing a self condensation, so RO minus ROH, and I want to figure out how to make the enone product, right? Another good indicator is that you see a delta. That's how you know it's an enone. But again, I'm pretty sure you're always going to push the enone in this class, so no worries. Um, all you have to do is on the alpha carbon, draw a double bond. Below that double bond is just going to be the two groups on your carbonyl. So that H and that um, and that ethyl and that ethyl there is what are going to go there, and that's your enone product. You can spin this if you want to. Like if it, if you want to and you want to make it look like that, you can do that. Okay. The reason why I like to do it this way is because it kind of shows you another way to think about this trick. Basically, what you're doing is you're taking two carbonyls erasing the oxygen on one of them, and then placing all that's left after erasing oxygen on that alpha carbon, just like that. So remember the imine trick? The imine trick was we erase oxygen 
right? So what we do is we draw this, we erase the oxygen, and then we put nitrogen and its R group. I mean, you're basically doing the same thing, right? You're doing pretty much the same thing here, but instead of replacing oxygen with a nitrogen, what you're doing is you're replacing oxygen with the alpha carbon and then everything attached to it, right? Just like that. It's essentially what you're doing for this trick, okay? So let's just do a couple of these, um, simple and hard, just to get you guys used to it. But maybe I have this and I'm doing RO minus ROH. How do I predict the product in two seconds? I can go ahead and draw the original aldehyde. Again, I'm basically taking this guy. Like one way to think about it is you're taking this guy and you're just doing this. You're putting it right there like that. So we can do that. Right, I can do this and then I can erase this. What if you could do this right on your paper is just like do that. Like just match it like that. That'd be pretty cool, right? Um, save you guys a lot of time probably. Um, but we can't use iPads, I guess. Right? You can do that. The other thing that you could do is you could take this, draw a double bond at that alpha position. And then again, the two groups on that aldehyde, just draw them under, you know, just draw them on that pi bond. Exact same product. Okay. I know some people like to draw theirs linearly, like they like to draw theirs like this. You can do that too. The way that I recommend you do that is you draw your aldehyde like this, where the Everything, you know, after the alpha carbon, you kind of just draw below like that. That way this is, you know, you can do it a lot more cleanly, right? Put that there. And then again, put the two groups. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then there's a methyl here, right? And there you go. Exact same trick, right? If you're doing it this way, right? If you're doing it this way, you're, you're basically doing the same thing. You just have the carbonyl kind of like oriented the other way. Right? You're basically erasing here, and then you're doing this. Boom, just like that. Look at that, so easy, right? That's how I did that earlier one in two seconds. It's not because I did the mechanism in five seconds in my head or anything, it's just because I know this trick makes my life 20 times easier. Okay, let's do another one. Um, do a ketone that's like kind of long, I guess. Um, oh, you know what? No, 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 we'll do this one. Okay, this ketone kind of sucks actually, but we'll still do it, it's okay. Um, but this one, again, actually, let's put this here just so we can think about it a little more. Um, again, we can draw a double bond here, and then the two groups here, we can just kind of draw like that, and then like that. That probably won't be the isomer that's the best one, right? You don't want those torpedoes in each other's faces, so probably we'll get something like that um, a lot better. But again, all about drawing a correct answer, right? We're not Maybe we're not too concerned about drawing um, the best answer, just a correct answer, right? Now, one thing that I might have kind of just assumed, I should have said out loud, is how did I know to do the reaction here and not here? Again, this is all enolic chemistry. So we want to go on the side that the alpha hydrogen is going to be taken off of. There's an alpha hydrogen here. There isn't one here. So we know that's going to form on this side, the enolate, and we're going to get the addition there. Okay. Um, I can even do this the way that I just mentioned, where I draw the ketone. I draw this methyl down, put the carbonyl there. And then again, I just put a terpetal and then a methyl just like that, because that's or ethyl. Those are the two groups there. Again, anything will work, right? The point is just to get, you know, just to have, understanding of how the trick works, right? But that's how we can do some self-condensation. So I don't want to spend too much time. We're kind of running out of time and I still need about 10 more minutes to get through the rest of this. Um, so obviously self-condensation is very, very useful. But what if I wanted to take an acetone and combine it with an acetal or acetaldehyde? I wanted to do a mixed condensation, right? How is this going to work? Well, it turns out it doesn't, it really doesn't. Um, you get a mixture of products, um, a slurry, if you will. So this is gonna be yuck, gooey, gooey, gooey mess. Um, why is that? Well, first off, we have all these analyzable protons on the um, carbonyl. You know, these are the same, so we'll just say both of these. So first off, how do we know who is gonna deprotonate um, and who isn't, right? Again, all these are about the same in pKa. So yes, aldehydes are a bit more, you know, reactive, but you can still argue that, hey, this guy get deprotonated. So one thing is, I don't know if I'm going to make an, a, a ketone minus or if I'm going to make an aldehyde minus. I have no idea. The other issue here is that not only do I not know who's going to become the minus, but how do I know who the minus is going to attack? It's not like we can communicate with them and ask them who, who they should attack. And if, they could, if we could communicate, who knows if they're even going to listen? So I could attack another acetone with the acetone enolate, right, to form this product here. I could attack an acetaldehyde, right, and that will form this product here, 
right? Again, all I'm really doing is I'm putting all of this, essentially all of this on that alpha carbon right there, right? All of this on that alpha carbon right there. That's what I'm doing. So I'm getting those products in two seconds. So I get these two products. And again, same thing here, right? How do I know that this guy is gonna attack an, um, an acetone? And how do I know that this guy is going to attack or if that guy's gonna attack um, another acetaldehyde? I don't know. And that's what's making me so scared about this. So mixed aldols are very, very bad if both guys have halva hydrogens. Very, 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 very bad. Not, not a good, good story at all. You get four different products. Usually the highest in product is the aldehyde-aldehyde combination. You usually get about 40, 50% of this, and then everything else makes up about 30%, and you get a bunch of unreacted material. Um, very, very bad tar. Uh, not something you don't, you don't deal with. So how do we solve this issue, right? Well, if the issue is that both of them can analyze and attack each other, um, you know, have an all-out war, um, you know, kind of got to clip off someone's arms, right? What if I take that aldehyde and I take away its ability to analyze? So now it's non-analyzable, right? This has the, uh, the ability to analyze, right, um, to have that proton pulled off, but this guy doesn't. So in every single instance, we're always going to have this minus charge form. Now, all we have to worry about is who we're going to attack. And so generally, there's uh, you know, kind of two ways to do this. One thing you can do is you can you know, use specific lab techniques that we assume we're going to use so that you always get um, you know, the product you want. The other is you just use a very reactive non-analyzable. right? So an aldehyde is always more reactive than a ketone. So we know that this guy is always going to attack here. So we can form our double bond, and we have two H's here like that. This is a very good mixed aldol. Um, you, you might form a little bit of this product. I won't lie. Right? You might form a little bit of this, but not a lot. Very, very little, in my opinion, you would form of that. Um, and it's not really that big of a deal, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't really worry too much. Okay, cool. So we can do these mixed aldols as long as we have a non-analyzable partner. And the non-analyzable partner is the guy that we're going to do the thing where we say, hey, when we, you know, when we draw the double bond on the alpha carbon, the two groups that goes on the other side is going to come from the non-analyzable. Okay. So, so some very common non-analyzables are um, this here, right? So terpetyl aldehyde, I guess terpetyl, di you know, diterpetyl ketone, but this is a terrible electrophile, very, very bad. But we, I guess we could use it. Um, formaldehyde, famous. Uh, we talked about this one last time too, right? That dimerizes. So it's a little bit of a something. So let's say that I had this ketone here and I wanted to do a mix. I could do the aldehyde with the, this guy here, right? Um, I know that this guy is gonna analyze. So I can go ahead and draw that. On the alpha carbon, draw a double bond. And then again, the two groups on that non-analyzable, I'll go ahead and draw out just like that, okay? And I'll get this product here. That's my aldol product. Okay. Again, remember, we can even add electrophiles to this. So maybe I add an HCl. Um, that's going to do that conjugate addition, right? So look at that. That's cool, isn't it? Um, a way to do, you know, apply all the information we've kind of learned. Okay. Um, maybe I have an aldehyde that's analyzable, and then I react it with a non-analyzable, um, like formaldehyde. Okay. Formaldehyde is really easy. Actually, formaldehyde, if you see that as your partner, you just draw a double bond, the alpha, call it a day. That's literally it. Formaldehyde is the easiest, easiest one to do. You just draw a double bond there, you call it a day. Uh, you're not going to stress out any more on that. Okay, cool. So with that, I'm going to call it there just because I want to finish on time. Um, give myself 10 more minutes on here. Um, actually, give me, actually, yeah. I'll, you just want to spend, don't want to spend too much time. The last thing to talk about is the intramolecular um, aldols, which is just if you have ketones and aldehydes. Um, if, if you are given a nice, you know, if you're given a nice question, it'll be either a diketone or it'll be a dialdehyde. Um, I'll show you the diketones first. Um, for the diketones, especially these symmetric ones, um, there's kind of two positions that can analyze, right? There's this one and there's this one. And usually the question is, is which one will go first? Um, to, to check really quickly, you can just count from what I call the inside carbon to the carbonyl. So one, two, three, four. Um, and then you can count from the outside carbon to the carbonyl. So what do I mean by that? I mean, one, oops. So like from here to here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? Um, so always starting from an alpha carbon, whether it's on the inside or the outside, that's how I like to call it. 
um, and just checking for which one gives you the five or the six. Cool thing is you'll never have to choose between five or six. It will either you will either get five or six versus some other number. Um, so in this case, it was four versus six. Six is what's going to win. So look for those five or six membered rings. Um, that's the analyzation that's going to happen. So this here would be what I call an outside cyclization. So if you want to write this on your note card, that would really help out. But this is an outside cyclization where this would be one attacking two, three, four, five, and then six. And what we're going to get from this always is a six-membered ring, where if I number this one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? On one, we attack two. So two is going to have an O minus on it and this methyl here. And then it looks like three, four, five have nothing. Six has the carbonyl that did the attack. Okay. Now this will just protonate in solution. And then again, we're going to dehydrate across one and two. What we get out is this enone product here. So whenever you do an outside cyclization, right, on a ketone, so again, outside being, you know, out like outside of the dicarbonyl, right, what we're going to get is um, this product here, okay? Um, and again, if this were instead like a five-membered version of this, so that would just look like this. So one attacks two, three, four, five. All that changes is that the shape changes to five, right? This is still the same. The shape just changes to five. So if you remember the, you know, if you or you write down your note card, what an outside cyclization looks like, technically you get two for free, right? You can, you get to see what the um, five member ring also looks like. It's, it's the same, it's no different, okay? If I wanted to do an inside cyclization, I have to get a little creative here. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are always a bit longer, um, but again, you can always do the counting. So one attacks two here, one attacks two, three, four, five, and six. So you can see I engineered this to be six. Um, look at this, if I did it from here, this would be what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, we're looking for five or six. So you can see how one, one side will be correct, the other won't. So what would this look like if I did it? Uh, in this case, I would get again a six membered ring, reckon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, one attacks two, so two again is going to have the O minus and the methyl. Three, four, five have nothing. Six has nothing. One has the original ketone on it. So you can see how this might differ now. Again, we're going to dehydrate across one and two here. Okay. And so what we get here is this, which is what I call an inside cyclization. And again, if I did the five membered version of this, it would just look like this. Okay. Cool. So what I want you guys to notice is that when you do an outside cyclization, the ketone is sort of fused into the ring, right? So when you do an outside cyclization, it's fused into the ring. Um, if you do an inside cyclization, right, the ketone is outside the ring, okay? So a cool little thing to kind of, you know, a little pattern you can notice if you'd like, or you can use um, for, your, for your help there, okay? Aldehydes are great because aldehydes can only analyze on one side. So it's either gonna be five or six on the inside. So either you're gonna get this one, two, oh, not that actually. Either you're going to get this, which is one, two, three, four, five, which is an inside cyclization. So we're going to get something like this, right? Or we're going to get the six membered version. Okay. That's always going to be the case for dialdehyde. All right, cool. So thank you, dialdehydes, for making our life easier as versus ketones. Now, let's say you get a keto aldehyde. So bound to be a question someone has, what if I get a keto aldehyde? Um, general rule of thumb is the ketone always attacks the aldehyde, okay? So ketone attacks aldehyde, not the other way around, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six. This is always gonna make the six member, this is an outside cyclization, so the ketone is gonna be fused into the ring, right? And we're gonna get this here. Again, you can use your counting. I'm just using the stencils that I use on the other page. I have them in my brain. That's where I got that, okay? Um, you could also have had it where one, two, three, four, five, right? Where the inside of the ketone attacked, right? That's also possible. Again, it's all about counting. It's just a counting game. That's possible too, okay, cool. All right, so you can see that we can kind of make a bunch of, you know, complex products. And again, we can continue to react these. Um, I think, uh, you know, I can, let me check real quick on, um, 
Let me check real quick. Someone sent me the uh, email. Let's see, did she, what did she mention? Okay, so it looks like um, you don't really have to worry about conjugated carbonyl additions. Technically, um, I'll, I'll include at the last page here for those of you to think about it, but when you make the enone, you can actually add into it um, enolates as well. So this could be something that shows up just in case if it does, I'll show it to you right now. But you could actually get a minus attack here, um, you know, do conjugate addition. Um, what this will always make, in, in, if it is the case, is a one to five dicarbonyl. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, one, two, three, four, and five. So, so that's something if you need to worry about it, you can, that's what it will make. Um, but yeah, uh, this could lead to, I mean, the worst possible situation I can see of this being used is you do like, let's say a self aldol here, um, like that. And then you do the addition of, um, let's say an acetone, um, so RO minus ROH, do an addition of an acetone. Again, that will give you the one five, which will look like, let me do some numbering. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Just so you can see where I'm getting this stuff from. So it looks on four, there's a methyl. Um, three has an ethyl on it. And then we have, uh, right, this methyl here. And then you could do a, a cyclization, right? one attacks here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, unless you've seen something like this, I wouldn't stress too much about it. Um, but I'm just including it just in case, because I don't know. So we can do that counting there, right? One attack, two, so two will have an OH on it. Three has a methyl, four has an ethyl, five, six is the carbonyl that attacks. So again, we're gonna dehydrate across one and two there. Um, and there you go. So that's a very crazy, I mean, if you really wanted to, you can <laughs> keep doing that, right? That's actually how they made steroids back in the days, um, like steroid molecules, as they did a bunch of Michael additions um, to make these, like a bunch of these six-membered rings. Um, steroids are what, I've, um, what I worked on when I was at Davis. Cool. But with that, um, I think we hit an hour, and I'm going to call it here. Um, any questions, please let me know. Hopefully this covered everything um, that you guys went over. Um, and hopefully the trick helps a lot, um, doing the trick with... Um, you know, the you know, how to do those products really fast. Um, one more day left. So please ask as many questions as you have. I'm more than willing, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, just very quickly going to check to see if I missed anything. I don't think I did. So we'll just call it there. Um, good luck to you guys. Let me know if you need a help. Thanks. Yeah.